to unleash your inner Goldilocks, how to get it just right. Thank you so much for joining us for another conversation with a exciting, fun, and deeply meaningful human being who's going to help us think, take perspective, and set the week on course so that we too can embrace our balance and take a lesson from Goldilocks and live a very meaningful life that is full of fun and opportunities. Today, to join me in conversation, is somebody I just recently met. But even though we just recently met, I feel like I have known this woman for a very, very long time. We met because of professional connections and introductions, but the actual human connection that took place was so deeply spiritual and personal. I cannot wait for you to meet Maggie Dillon. Maggie, welcome. Thank you. And you can happily unleash your Goldilocks inside and outside. <laughs> that that I will be happy to do so. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to meet with you. And, and I can't say enough things. Likewise, I, I'm sure all your viewers could resonate when I say that you are just truly such an outstanding person from the very second you start talking. And, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. My pleasure. So Maggie also goes by the uh, recognition of an empress. So you are in the presence of an empress today. <laughs> and Maggie, there are, you, you are truly a whole person. Professionally, you're in technology, you're in security, you're a co-author in the book Hacked 2. But you're also in this world of holistic living and spiritually connecting and living and eating and breathing and being in a space that we all as divine beings are supposed to be. So from a perspective of Goldilocks, let's talk about the personal holistic side first. Absolutely. I What got you to that point, being a techie? First, I would say I I had really, I've been in so many different industries, just growing throughout my career and, and started rather young in the corporate ladder and started out in executive headhunting actually with governmental contracts with Lockheed Martin and was recruiting doctors to do pre-discharge exams for soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. It was the peak of the backlog for the VA. And as my career grew, uh, recruited accounting and finance professionals, C-suite executives, uh, everything from retail, you name it, I did it. And about seven years ago, uh, I I've always had a huge passion for children. And I came across an organization that really kind of lit the flame of how how to take my passion for children and protecting people, but also, you know, where were things headed technology wise? Where did I think the economy was going to head? Now, mind you, this is pre pandemic and uh, I'm glad I made the decision I did when I did, but I, I decided to make this shift into information technology specifically. And there was an organization, they're called the Child Rescue Coalition. Uh, the website's actually childrescuecoalition.org. I, I highly recommend recommend anyone go by there. But they had developed a technology that was truly taking down horrible people doing very bad things between sex trafficking and uh, sharing child images and things of this nature. And I thought, there it is. I, I have to be a part of an industry where I could make drastic change for future generations in all capacities. And so uh, switch to IT and then moved over into cybersecurity specifically. But uh, it, it's been a, a, an amazing journey. The pandemic happened, which only reconfirmed that I made the right decision and the world changed rather rapidly, still is. So that's kind of how I decided to bring who I am and, and just my personality, uh, some of the experiences I've personally been through and then connect it on a 3D level in industry and, and go from there. Nice. So now I'm going to ask you something, a little tongue in cheek. Why empress? And I say this, I always, when people tell me, are you a princess? And I say, no, I'm a goddess, right? So this is a conversation between a goddess and an empress. 
<laughs> so what what made you take that moniker? So uh, it's actually turned into a very, I'll call it a movement. I, I started my own YouTube channel back in 2019, and I'm a spiritual practitioner of all facets. I, I am not um, dedicated to one religion or one practice in particular, but I really wanted to be a part of ethereal beliefs. I, I have a, a passion for theology and researching and all, all different types of cultures. And I, I wanted to be able to create a, a comfortable space where people could come just to learn. And, and I love to teach just as much as I love to be a student. And so I created my channel, which actually had a different handle at the time that made sense at the time. And it it's grown very organically and it's been truly the most rewarding thing I think I've ever done or created. And I've met so many amazing people across the world in many different industries and stories. And it, it's, it's just been such a beautiful thing. And uh, once I went into cybersecurity, I wanted to tie in my professional life with that platform in particular. One of the things that I offer, uh, and I, and I call it a tool to help open our subconscious. And that's as simple as that. People have various beliefs on it. And, and I, I take no, uh, what's the best word? I try, try to be politically correct, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tarot reader. I practice tarot, but I, I practice many different facets of, of all religions. I, I was raised Irish Catholic, uh, so I have very much respect for, for that tradition and, and still go uh, with my family. And so uh, I kind of got into um, tarot and, and I I'm gifted and it's, it's something that has helped me grow as an individual in many different areas. It's helped many others. I, I have several who have told me I've helped inspire some type of awakening and, and I, whether it's me or you or anybody, I, I want that for everyone just to feel grounded in who they are. And so, uh, my favorite card in the tarot deck is the Empress card. And okay. There's a reason for that. There's many different, you know, a lot of, a lot of detail on that, but I thought, well, I, I wanted to start my own company and I wanted to tie that in with cybersecurity and, and cybersecurity in particular, there's only 18% of women making up that industry right now. We are very depleted. And also on top of that, we are at a 3.5 million deficit of people in cybersecurity. We are, we are in major crisis right now. And so I created, uh, changed my handle for my YouTube channel at the time. And I said, all right, I want to teach people about technology and security and overall protection of their well-being, but also their assets and their, you know, their people and businesses. And so hence Empress of Security 777 is uh, now my handle on YouTube. And also my company is called Empress Security Insights. Beautiful. That was a really I long answer. <laughs> But I know it's good to have the context and the history because now it's very clear for the audience that it's not, you don't have to be a nerd to go into cybersecurity, right? So oh. all of you heard, heard it here. There are so many jobs. If you can get into the field and get certified, there are opportunities. If you're looking for work, here is an avenue and you don't have to give up your personality. That's the message you're giving. You can balance yourself and have your personal and your professional and have fun with it. And I love, I absolutely love that about you. And you are a woman who's not afraid to be firm and strong. At the same time, don't ever hold back in being vulnerable and gentle and loving. Yes. Okay? And that is not an easy mix for people to arrive at. And so help us, our audience understand what it took you to get there and what it takes you every day to have the courage to say, it doesn't matter what other people do to me. Even if they hurt me, I am going to be me. I am going to be my loving, caring, compassionate self. At the same time, I'm going to be assertive and accountable and responsible in doing what I need to do. Oh man, I love these questions. I, it has truly been one of the scariest processes of 
overcoming so many fears. You know, when, when you're working every day with multimillionaires, these people who have such, you know, enormous degrees and power and status and, and, you know, it, it's a very humbling process. I come from very humble beginnings and, and I will always remain very humble. I've, I've gone through a lot of challenges personally in my own life. Uh, and, and I think, I got to a point, I was actually in a very severe car accident in 2019 that, that changed my life. And I knew then that if I kept trying to fit this mold for corporate America, for what my family expected of me, and, and I always had very high expectations from my family, that pressure really built on me over the years. It was intense. And I come from a long line of very strong champion level women. My mother was an equestrian champion. She's the strongest woman, but she was also the scariest, most loving person at the same time as most mothers should be. Uh, and so I, I think I got to a point where after that accident and, and just going through that emotional process that came with it, I had to take the mask off. And I knew if I didn't, I was not going to be able to accomplish the things I wanted on my own terms in alignment with my faith and my belief and my, and the growth that I wanted with that and my professional career. And the scariest part was how can I be, I mean, you can't just go up to someone and say, Hey, I read tarot. Uh, if you ever want to talk, let me know. Most people are anti any of that, you know? And, and again, I, I love talking about any, I just love asking people questions. You know, what, what do you believe in? Let's talk about it. Let's get deep. You know, let's have these really life depth conversations. And then, oh, by the way, can I help you with your business and operations and help you make millions of dollars, Mr. CEO? You know, it's like, how do you pair those? Right. And so I knew I'm like, well, I got to take the mask off. I got to be as real and authentic as I can. I can, I have to be okay with making mistakes. You cannot be successful without failure. You know, I always tell people this, this uh, statistic, Michael Jordan, one of the most revered basketball players of all time, made 9,000 missed shots. 9,000 failures. Does anyone think about that? No. They think about his overcoming of things and how much of a leader he was and how many people he inspired. Um, same thing with, you hear about people like Robert Downey Jr. who served time in prison for being an addict and having a really tumultuous life and he ends up becoming a superhero and is now inspiring so many people across the world with his testimony. So uh, I've got a testimony of my own and, and I knew that I had to own up to a lot of what I had been through. And I, I knew that these stories were uncomfortable for most to hear, but I knew they had to be shared, but I still had to keep privacy for myself, respect for my industry, respect for my fellow colleagues. And it wasn't easy. I got thrown to the wolves, you know, when, when I was going through this process and I, and I, you know, going back hindsight's 2020, I would have done things way differently and would have approached them way differently and gotten resources much sooner to get me to where I am today, but we all make mistakes. That's how we learn. Right. So what I would tell anybody is take some time for yourself. I, I took a trip by myself, uh, and, and had a lot of alone time to really have a come to Jesus type of moment and say, okay, it's now or never. If, if I'm really going to be this person that I know I want to be, I have to completely create a brand new life and it has to be authentic. It cannot be, it cannot be fake. It cannot be what society wants me to be. It cannot be any of that, but also it has to be integrity filled. I have to have virtue still. I have to operate with the divine appropriately. I have to still follow laws and rules but still be the rebel that I am and, and the, the outspoken, you know, my, all my colleagues are calling me a hurricane, a tornado, all this stuff. I'm like, I don't know about all that. I'm just trying to be myself, you know, and I take pride in that because when you call me a hurricane, that's right. I'm a change agent for the better. And that wasn't always the case. And I'm okay with saying that now. And I've, I've made peace with, with myself, hopefully with the people uh, that it's affected, but also, it builds trust really well. And the foundation is so solid now. And if someone doesn't resonate with that and they don't want to do business with me or stay in my life for friendship wise or any of that, I'm okay. I just want everyone to be happy and, and do what's best for them. So 
And that is brilliantly said because not everybody is each other's cup of tea and some don't even drink tea. That's right. right. I don't and drink. So that, I want to say is tell you with that. I'm not everybody's favorite cup of tea, but that's all right because I drink coffee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am a teetotaler. So that is funny. There you go. So I, I love some of the examples you're giving and how in the business world, these other spiritual practices and other things may sound like voodoo. That brought to my mind, I was keynoting the CFO conference in Dallas a few years ago. And the theme of the conference was predictive analytics. And I opened it up with saying, predictive analytics is what gave me my name. And the predictive analytics I'm talking about is in the Hindu tradition, we predict the future of a child based on the longitude, latitude, and the exact millisecond the child was born in, and the planetary positions and the astrology and the metaphysics predicts. And then what does this child need to live a harmonious life is how a child is named. So I kicked off with saying, so I stand here before you with this name because of predictive analytics. And it's strange that I have pursued a path of finance and predictive analytics, integrating fintech into business strategy. And it was a nice way to draw people in into a conversation. So I was smiling when you were talking about it because there is a way to affect the combined two. I and we, love that explanation. Uh, you know, thank you. So, thank you. So I'm, I'm so glad that other people are, are saying these things because it's, it's the truth. It's, it's, and I have a lot of respect for Hindu tradition because of just how they operate. So thank you for saying that people need to hear more of that type of stuff. It, it's true. Thank you. So as you are living this life of balancing who you are, what you love to do, and how you want to show up in life. You truly are the model of what the Goldilocks community is helping people become because it's a process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And we all make mistakes. We all learn and grow. And the transformation process is what polishes us, right? Absolutely. And in that process, we are learning to let go. If you had a couple of pieces of advice for people, who feel like they have to be in this straight jacket because that's the only way they're going to be accepted, the only way they're going to be loved. And in the process, they've lost themselves. They've stopped loving themselves. And that's an empty life. If you don't love you, then what's the point in everybody else loving you? And what advice do you have for people to break that? It's almost a curse, right? How do you break that trajectory and look inside? Absolutely. Two things. I'm going to approach it from a logical standpoint. Uh, men really struggle with this in, in a lot of uh, emotional capacity. Men are very logical thinkers. Uh, women, same thing. But I think we need to look at the physiology first and foremost. Our brains are literally built for survival. Uh, the minute our perception perceives danger, change, fear, it is literally built to make us not want to do something. And it's a chemical reaction. So when you understand that anything that feels uncomfortable is automatically going to click your fear on, now you understand how your vessel, your machine, it's the same thing with a car. Uh, you know, if your oil gets low in your car, boom, oil light comes on, you need to get an oil change. Okay. So think about something like that. If you've got a chemical change going on in your brain, oh, that's fear. That's just my brain telling me that because we are, I mean, think of the millions of years of, of evolution of where we've come as a species. That's just a survival instinct. So once you kind of understand that process, now you can know, all right, is this really a threat or is it just my brain? So there's the first part. Second part would be people pleasing. I think the number one thing that holds people back, keeps them in that straight jacket, keeps them from not being their true divine being of who they want to be. Not to say that they're not amazing as is. A lot of people go through this. It's a silent war in their head. It's, it's affected mental health so bad. We're in a mental health pandemic because of it. 
Not to mention you add any type of outside factors in on that that make it even worse, but people pleasing. Everyone is so worried about what others will think. And that is the most paralyzing process of detrimental, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's very detrimental to someone's life path. Because if you're worried about what your family thinks, if you're worried about your coworkers, your colleagues, what will happen to your career, if you're worried about what your partner, your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, it will literally keep you stagnant from being who you want to become. So I often imagine, I'm, I, I resonate a lot with Muhammad Ali. I'm, I'm a big person on fighting and, and strength and, and just, uh, plus I'm a kickboxer. I've done Muay Thai kickboxing, these types of things. I always think of, okay, I got it's me against my ego. We're in a boxing match. I'm not losing. If it's a death match, I'm not losing. Well, guess what does that mean? My ego is going to have to lose. And until you can stop people pleasing, first and foremost, you got to get rid of that. Now it's you against your ego. Because once you've stripped everybody else out of it, you know, you got to kind of imagine you're a hermit. You're going up on a mountain by yourself to figure it out. And you're not coming down from that mountain until you figure it out. Well, you can't do that if your ego is constantly in your head telling you, don't do this. You have to act right. You got to stay in this perfect little fake box. You know, everyone has this cookie cutter perception. And I've interviewed thousands of people over the years. And first 10 minutes, you know, they, I would say 98% of people, when I interview them, they all say the first, you know, they give me the, the same, you know, I've done this. Here's my skills. That's it. I'm like, you know what? Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. That's fantastic. I appreciate you letting me meet your representative. And then I changed my body posture. And that's part of the reason I took this call here on my couch. I want everyone to feel comfortable. Let's just, it, it's too uptight in the world. Let's, let's bring it down. And, and then I say, okay, so tell me a little bit about yourself. And then you start meeting the real person. It's the same thing when you're trying to break that mold. Who really are you? And if you don't know, create a new version of yourself. Simple as that. I think people just get too wrapped up in their heads. They're their own worst enemy. Absolutely. One of the things I do anytime I'm interviewing people to work with me, I always ask them, tell me about you. I've read your resume. I've checked all the backgrounds. I've checked the references. Tell me about you. So they start repeating the resume. I say, no, no, no. I need to know about you. Then they tell me where they were born, their religion, their parents. I'm like, no, who are you? And I was interviewing a grown man. He was in his early 50s. And I said, no, I really want to know you. So tell me who X is. This man broke down in tears and told me, you know what? I am a grown man and nobody has ever bothered to ask me who I am. And I have never had the opportunity to talk about it. And then the floodgates opened breaking. and we talked. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and some people don't have an answer to that question. Oh. A, a lot. I, same thing. I've had so many people break down crying to me in interviews because I just want them to take down the veil and know first and foremost, what you say stays with me. It's confidential. Second of all, this is a safe space. It's just a matter of creating a safe conversation to be vulnerable with one another. A lot of people don't have someone they even feel comfortable being vulnerable in front of. They, just like what you said, no one's ever asked me that. Or I haven't talked about that in years. No, I haven't really talked about myself in that way. You know, a lot of people don't want to go get therapy, you know, for many different reasons. So, uh, or, or they just don't have an outlet. They don't journal. They don't work out to release endorphins. There's a lot of factors that add up. So it's, it's, yeah, I think that's awesome. I, I love that about you. I, I know that, uh, you and I had had a similar moment when we first talked. So it's it's a thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love to open this up for any questions. Robin, I know we are having an interesting conversation, but I'm sure you have some insights and interesting perspective to share. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, very interesting um, 
I am from a pretty solid faith tradition, Christian faith tradition, but I've learned over the years to layer on top of that uh, because I became, um, in a professional sense, uh, integrated with some people who are very much into astrology and numerology. And I found that the, her gentle approach and just the way she approached that, I found it just um, uh, I, I layered on. I, so I don't I didn't say, OK, I need to get rid of my faith tradition because I'm learning about astrology and numerology. Anybody listening to this is going to go, wow, <laughs> Ron is, is listening to astrology, you know, or numerology. And it's like. I, I at least the way it was presented to me, I viewed it as another asset, another layering on of what I already have. Which I think is really good. So I was going to ask, you made a comment that um, that you had, that you would do things a lot differently if you were to do them over, you're kind of, you know, finding your way and you had to, you know, make some amends, as they say in the 12-step programs, make some amends. So what what is one thing that you would have done differently uh, that you now realize oh, there's a better way? And so you don't have, so you wouldn't have to make those amends. <laughs> I, it, I, I went through a really traumatic experience when I was 19 years old and, and unfortunately I didn't say anything about it for 10 years. I would have done that differently. I would have gotten a help a lot quicker. I would have gotten more resources. Uh, it really affected my relationships. It affected my self-worth. It affected my, my own mental health severely. And a lot of most people didn't even know I did a great job of fooling it and wearing this fake mask and going out here acting like everything was hunky dory. So that would probably be the first thing. I uh, I think the other thing that I, I would have done differently is fought harder to share my emotions more. I I was so raised to you don't cry. You don't show weakness. And, and a lot of us were, you know, I mean, our parents can only be as good as what they were taught. And and the older I get, the more I see. And I, I just have so much more compassion and forgiveness for my own parents. And I, I, gave, them a, I gave them a ride. God love them. Uh, but I, I think that it, I, I, as you get older and you mature, I think we all wish we would have done things differently, but you're, we all go through it. There's not a single adult I've ever met that says, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have done this differently. Uh, you know, I, case in point, I decided at 18, I had actually gotten a scholarship offered to me from Notre Dame University. And instead of doing that, I decided I wanted to take two years off. Mind you, I thought my parents were going to have a heart attack. Okay. Took two years off so I could hang out and have fun with friends. And I did. And then I went to college. Never would have made that choice. I should have, I should have just kept on the path, you know, but we all make mistakes. It is what it is. And I want to kind of go back to your point to something that you said, and, and I actually have it. I, I was looking for it. Dr. Dr. Henry knows this. I'm a geek with notes. Like I constantly take notes and everything. And I want to, I want to make a statement with regards to astrology and, and numerology and all of that. I love the way that you said it adds layers on, um, any, re any religion that's outside of your own beliefs, what, just because you're looking into other religions or, or spiritual practices or anything does not mean that one that doesn't say, again, you're worried about what others think that's, that's between you and source, you and your God, you and whoever, whoever your higher power is. But, uh, I, and this is a statement I've been saying in a lot of my, my readings and, and I try to call them more lessons because we just use it as a tool. But the whole reason why tarot is so effective is because we are using a tool for you to access universal intelligence. Those images create associations for people's minds that I, as a reader, am incapable of reaching. Your subconscious creates your reality. And that takes a lot of pressure off. And I'm, I'm aware of what it says in the Bible and everything, but I love to hear you even say, you know, and, and you even put a preface on there. Oh, people are probably thinking, oh, Robin, you know right there. It's no, you're just a student. You, you love to learn. It's as simple as that. And anyone who judges you for that, that tells you a lot about them, you know? So. Yeah. It's great. I'm I listening to this conversation and I'm smiling, right? Coming from the Hindu tradition. It's not a religion. It's a way of life. 
And the only reason we're called Hindus is the Europeans didn't understand the people from the Hindus Valley. So they called us all Hindus and made it into a religion. But yoga and meditation and Ayurvedic lifestyle and even Kama Sutra, it's all part of how we live. It's not what we do, right? Yoga is not what we do. Meditation is not what we do. It's how we live. It's a state of being. And the way we look at it is our entire ecological climate system is tied to astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Astrology is astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Numerology is everything in this world can be explained with numbers. Yep. I, I don't and know. So if it's truly it. scientific. It only becomes something else if we separate the science from the spirit. Mm -hmm. But when you come from a tradition where your soul, your spirit is part of that energy around you. So spirituality and science are not separate and apart. They're two sides of the same coin. The same way the masculinity and femininity sit side by side. That's why in our culture, whoever we give a human form is half male, half female. There's a god and a goddess to help us embrace both aspects of us, the yin and the yang, the god and the goddess within us. So to me, I don't see a difference, right? It's a looking at light and putting it through a prism and seeing all the colors in the rainbow and it's still the same white light. Am I able to take perspective? So to me, it's fascinating because I don't come from the Western tradition. But I have been able to embrace fully the Western tradition because in my culture, we don't separate. I can go into a church and pray. I have read the Bible in all three languages I spoke growing up. I sang in the school church choir. And I can do all of that while practicing my way of life. Yep. And, and to your point, your energy is so authentic it's deep it has substance you don't judge anyone else for their beliefs you don't do anything of that and this this really goes down into our foundations and who we are uh and how we can truly break out of those molds and feel comfortable about what we're talking about this entire conversation and it's, it's the same as if you're gonna bake a loaf of bread for instance are you just gonna have flour and expect a loaf of bread. No, you're going to need eggs. Well, what else are you going to need? You're going to need yeast. Think of it the same as any type of way of living. You know, it's same for you. It's it's very much a way of life. A lot of people will pocket it, you know, oh, I only do this on Sundays. And then they feel guilty if they don't do it on Sundays. And, uh, you know, or, and especially American culture in particular, we're, we're, we're a different, <laughs> we're a different topic in and of itself compared to the rest of the world. And unless you get out of that or you do some traveling or you have a, a variety of different types of people in your life, you're not going to realize just how different we really are from the rest of the world. It's, it's a very patriarchal do as I say, not as I do type of mentality with regards to all facets, facets of life. And so uh, I, I know so many people, you know, you get halfway through life and then you realize it was almost a facade in some type. And, and to your point with numerology and some of those things, they always say seeing is believing. Well, personally, I'm like, well, I want to take an ingredient from every little thing that maybe does show actual data or something I can prove or I can see or I can write about or I can read about that's tangible and tie that in with unyielding faith. And, and then if you're willing to be open-minded enough and learn about other people's beliefs or way of living, now we can have real communication without judgment. And gosh, what does that inspire? Love the highest frequency and highest power there is, right? It's as simple as that. People make it so much more difficult than it needs to be. It really, it's just, it's, it's humorous to me. At least I try to tell myself that, but yeah. And that is a perfect, perfect way to bring this amazing conversation to an end. Because ultimately, all we are striving to do is be loved. And in order to be loved, we need to be able to give love. 
it's one of those things where you have to give and receive to truly feel fulfilled. So take a page from Empress Maggie Dillon, right? And embrace you and embrace everything that is around you that's going to make your life richer, give your life meaning, and live your life the way you want to. And those who love you will be there for you without judgment. Absolutely. Those who care about you will find a way to support you. You don't have to change to meet every person's need because then you will end up losing you and don't. You deserve, you deserve to live your life. Go out there and be you and take Goldilocks with you because Goldilocks will remind you, take that balance, take that peace with you.